one of the key issues that this organization helped to pass, and that is country of origin labeling. So I want to go through a little bit of history with country of origin labeling. And it actually started before I came on board with RCAP, which I didn't do until 2001. But when I came on board, the first thing I started to do was look at this issue of country of origin labeling. And it was clear that Senator Johnson here in South Dakota in 1999 had introduced legislation to require labels to be affixed to products like beef, pork, and lamb, and fruits and vegetables. And that legislation was introduced in the Senate, but was going absolutely nowhere. There wasn't any support for it. One of the other cattle associations said that they actually came up with the idea of country of origin labeling, but they realized that Congress would never pass it, so they didn't encourage their members to pursue it. We looked at country of origin labeling and re realized that there was far more producers involved with this issue than just beef. So we went and talked to fruit and vegetable growers in Florida, orange juice growers. We talked to the Florida Department of Agriculture. We talked to tomato growers in South Texas and producers in California and Louisiana shrimp farmers and salmon fishermen up in Alaska. And we said, we need to get together on this. We need to include this in the next farm bill. So we had a coalition of about 200 different organizations scattered all across the United States. We met on a weekly basis, and our purpose was to include and to finally pass this measure called Country of Origin Label. It was passed in the 2002 Farm Bill, and we won by an upset. The opposition never figured that we would have this political strength to get this legislation passed because they kept it suppressed for years. But it was passed in 2002, and it was very clear right after it was passed that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the agency charged with implementing the law, did not like country of origin labeling. So they drug their feet in promulgating the rules necessary to implement the law that Congress had passed. And rather than proposing a rule as, as typically done, they instead sent out a voluntary guidance rule which really wasn't a rule at all, and it allowed things to kind of muddle forward. It allowed the opposition to rebuild their strength in order to rescind or otherwise defeat country of origin labeling. And the opposition came out extremely strong, convinced members of Congress that country of origin labeling was a huge mistake. That somehow, by informing consumers of the origins of the food they purchased for their families, we were going to disrupt international trade we were going to impose on the retail and wholesaling businesses across the United States an untenable financial burden they would all go broke. We were essentially going to stop the world if country of origin labeling actually went into effect as Congress intended it to do when they passed the law in 2002. So the opposition got enough members of Congress together to prevent USDA from going forward with what they didn't want to do in the first place. What they did was they went to the Appropriations Committee and convinced the Appropriations Committee to, in 2004 to pull all the funding for implementing country of origin labeling away from USDA until 2006. So the law was passed in 2002. In 2004, Congress passed the Appropriations Bill a rider that said USDA could not begin to promulgate rules on country of origin labeling until at least 2006, but for one exception. That exception was they couldn't go forward with cool for beef, lamb, pork, fruits, and vegetables, but for fish and shellfish, we'll let it go. Now, how'd that happen? Cool is going to be the worst possible financial burden to be imposed on retailers and wholesalers, but for fish and shellfish, we will let it go. Enter politics. Senator Stevens from Alaska it was, in, was very influenced by his salmon fishery industry in Alaska. The salmon fishermen realized their future depended on their ability to distinguish their U.S. grown salmon from salmon found in other parts of the world. And so Senator Stevens cut a deal behind closed doors and said, we're going to let fish and shellfish go through. I'm going to appease my salmon fishermen in my state. The rest of you can go, can go. And that's what happened. 
So in 2004, no implementation of cool until 2006, but for fish and shellfish. The rules were written very quickly in 2005, and suddenly we were able to see in the grocery stores labels on fish and shellfish. Then came 2006, the expiration of the prohibition against USDA going forward. In 2006, the opposition had further built their strength, further convinced Congress that cool was absolutely a protectionist issue. It was too costly. It would hurt producers. It would put our farmers and ranchers out of business. And so in their infinite wisdom, they passed another rider in the appropriations bill in 2006 that said USDA could not go forward to implement country of origin labeling until 2008. So it wasn't until 2008 that USDA actually wrote an interim final rule to kind of implement country of origin labeling, but not really. A rule has the force of law, but an interim final rule is a degree below the force of law, so it's really kind of a practice run. So USDA wrote an interim final rule in 2008, and Canada and Mexico came unglued. They did not want U.S. producers to distinguish their exclusive USA product from products of Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Nicaragua, or wherever. So Canada and Mexico, and we believe at the behest of U.S. meat packers, went to the World Trade Organization at the international level, and the U.S. ambassador met with the Canadian ambassador and the Mexican ambassador, and they struck a deal. Canada said, look, we won't file a formal complaint against you at the World Trade Organization if you will make some concessions in the rulemaking process. Now this is important because the rulemaking process is supposed to provide individual citizens in the United States and organizations that represent them the opportunity to participate in the governmental process to actually help write rules. So the USDA issues this final interim rule, asks for public comments, they give you a deadline, public comments are then received, the agency has an absolute duty to review those comments and to respond and address all the important concerns that are raised by the public in the rulemaking process. And then they issue a final rule. But what happened here was the rulemaking process was complete, the public provided their input, and then the ambassadors at the International World Trade Organization met and said we need to cut a deal. Canada and Mexico threatened the United States with a World Trade Organization complaint unless the USDA agreed to write in the rule a loophole to allow a diffusion of the USA label. And that's precisely what happened. As a result of this agreement, the agreement was you write the loophole in the, in the rule and we won't file a complaint against you. The loophole requested by Canada and Mexico was that if a meat packer on any given day mixed foreign product in with the USA product, that entire day's production was eligible for a mixed label. So let's look at our US meat packers, the largest, killing 5,000 head of cattle a day. They could kill 4,999 cattle that are exclusively of USA origin and bring in one Mexican head or one Canadian head and all of the meat produced from 5,000 head of cattle that day could be labeled product of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, thereby reducing the potential benefits of country of origin labeling and confusing altogether the consumers who didn't understand how could you have a steak produced in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. But that was the loophole that was written into the law at the request, at the threat of Canada and Mexico and it happened in 2008 and 2009. So the law passed in 2002, delayed in 2004 by Congress, delayed again in 2006 by Congress, finally a, a interim final rule in 2008, and the rule went into effect in March of 2009. Count the years, that's how long it took to get this measure through. And before the final rule's ink was dry, and even though the loophole, as requested by Canada and Mexico, was included in the rule, the first thing Canada and Mexico did was file a complaint at the World Trade Organization. 
arguing that the country of origin labeling law was a protectionist measure and that it discriminated against products from Canada and Mexico. So we had a World Trade Organization complaint and the World Trade Organization appointed three judges to oversee this complaint and literally millions of dollars was thrown into the hearing and the complaint process at the World Trade Organization. The United States has kind of sat on their hands. Now we have an international tribunal that is essentially second guessing our U.S. constitutional past laws and they are going to determine the fate of a law that was passed under the Constitution, that was passed in both houses of Congress, that was signed by the President, but now we have an unelected panel of foreigners overseeing our country of origin labeling law. And to no surprise in anyone in this room, the three judge panel of foreigners determined that the U.S. country of origin labeling law was a violation of international trade agreements. They said, number one, it violated the national treatment rule. It, as a result of the implementation of COOL, foreign products entering the United States were treated less favorably than were domestic products. That's the national treatment rule. You cannot treat imported products less favorably than you treat domestic products. Number two, they said the country of origin labeling law was more trade restrictive than necessary to meet the objective. In fact, they said, the country of origin labeling law does not meet the objective because it's confusing to consumers who don't understand how can a state be produced in Canada and Mexico. In other words, the very loophole they requested was then used as a means of finding a violation of our domestic law. So, fortunately, the new administration said they supported country of origin labeling where the last administration did not and they appealed this decision at the World Trade Organization. So at the appellate level of this unelected, unappointed, outside of the U.S. Constitution, this foreign entity appointed three judges. One was from India, one was from Belgium, and one was from Mexico. To hear a complaint filed by Mexico and Canada against the United States. Nowhere in American jurisprudence would you not consider this to be a clear conflict of interest to have a, na a Mexican national seat over here and render a decision on a complaint that their country had filed. But that's precisely what happened. So the appellate level at the World Trade Organization determined that the first three judges who were unelected and unappointed, erred. They were mistaken to find that the U.S. country of origin labeling law was more trade restrictive than necessary to meet the objective. What was the objective? To it accurately inform consumers as to the origins of their food. They realized that this was really going to be a problem. If they held, upheld that particular decision, when in fact that loophole was built in at the direct request of Canada and Mexico. So the three judge panel with a conflict of interest nevertheless upheld the World Trade Organization's attack against the country of origin labeling law by stating that it did in fact violate the national treatment rule. The U.S. country of origin labeling law discriminated against Canadian and Mexican product because it treated those products less favorably in the U.S. market than are like domestic products treated in the market. Specifically, they argued, Canada and Mexico's market share in the United States is small, relatively small. And as a result, that gave an incentive to meat packers to not purchase Canadian or Mexican product and instead exclusively produce U.S. product. They argued, in fact, that a packer couldn't decide to exclusively produce Mexican and Canadian products because there wasn't enough of that product to satisfy consumer demand in the United States. I mean, this, this line of logic gets really deep at this level. Nevertheless, 
The United States was faced with an adverse decision at the international level, and what did the United States do? They folded. Under the procedures of the World Trade Organization, the first step in a conflict like this, in a dispute resolution, after the appellate level, which is the highest level you can get to at the WTO, once they render a decision, the country that has been issued the adverse decision must then stand before the World Trade Organization and declare whether or not they intend to comply and to bring their law into compliance with the World Trade Organization. And at the end of August of 2012, that is precisely what our U.S. Trade Representative's Office did. They told the World Trade Organization, <coughs> we are going to comply. That triggered a time clock, 45 days. Canada, the United States, and Mexico then had to sit at a table within the next 45 days and determine how long it was going to take for the United States to bring its domestic constitutionally passed law into compliance with the International Trade Organization or the World Trade Organization's new directive. And so the U.S. and Canada and Mexico have been negotiating whether we can do this in eight months or 15 months. The short side, typically in World Trade Organization cases, dispute cases, you'd have eight or nine months to bring into compliance. On the long side, you have about 15 months. The United States has been asking for 15 months. Canada and Mexico said that's way too long. You can do this overnight. And so they filed another complaint at the World Trade Organization. And they asked the World Trade Organization to engage in arbitration and to issue a decision to force the United States or essentially to declare how much time the United States has to bring the law into compliance. So here we have a law passed under the U.S. Constitution, passed by both houses of Congress, signed by the President, after eight, nine years, finally implemented, finally put into effect, and now we have from Geneva, Switzerland, a decision that says we have to change our domestic law.